On today's starting nine, Jake and Carl get into some of the weekend action, including two National League legends taking the mound. Some fireworks in the Bronx. The Red Sox are certainly heating up. There's awards this show. There's a little bit of a new segment called Jake Explains. We're going to step into the Mets corner. We're going to go through some division standings. We're going to have a ton of fun. Let's get into it. It's starting nine. Action, and welcome back to starting nine, episode five. It is Carl in Barcelona, Chicago. We've got Colin Cooper in New York City, and of course, Jake Arietta in the lovely Austin, Texas. Boys, it's great to see your beautiful fucking faces. Uh, it's been a while. Good to be back with you. Yeah. How was your good? weekend? Yeah, I had a great weekend. Uh, I got the, I got a chance to play round of 18 with my dad, which is like, those are the best days ever. You get a chance to play golf with your dad. I also saw, I should have probably led with this. I met my new baby niece for the first time, Riley. Welcome to the world, Riley. So yeah, welcome, Riley. Yeah, welcome, Riley. And in no time, Riley will be probably playing travel, soccer, or softball or something. They'll be on the road. And uh, I know you're doing a lot of that now. It seems like every time we talk, you're like Dallas, Houston, you're running around doing the travel baseball tournaments. How's Cooper holding up? Yeah, it's every weekend at this point in time. Uh, we had a we had a big tournament in Houston. Won the first two games Saturday. Beat them up pretty good. We had a crazy downpour Saturday night. So a few of the games were rearranged and we didn't start we didn't start sunday we were supposed to start yes uh sunday at six o'clock the championship game would have been like at nine or ten o'clock fortunately they moved it up to three but we lost in the semis we lost a one nothing pitcher's duel they had a lefty on the mound throwing gas our guys couldn't get anything done but it was a tough tournament we lost to a team called the banditos which are historically a really good team in houston and they tried to recruit cooper after the game i said no nah, man we ain't doing that we ain't, we, ain't jump, we ain't jumping ship. No, not at 10 years old, no. No, no. But Cooper played well. We got a big tournament in a couple of weeks in Omaha during the College World Series, so we're looking forward to that. And I think you're going to be there, too, so we're going to link up and, and have a good time. Yeah, might be a little crossover there. We just let the cat out of the bag there, so I'm about to get a bunch of DMs from my buddies in Oops. Omaha, like, oh, fuck, shit's going to get real. I've been, I've been keeping that one close to my vest, so yes. It's out anno there. Announcement's out. So you bring up these tournaments, these literally, like, I shouldn't say literally, but like the, the 10 under travel or whatever. And do you remember when you're, you're like, little can the parents are like, all right, so you got a game at eight, then we're going to play a game at 11, you know, then you got a triple header in the afternoon and you're just, all you want to do, you're like, perfect. I'll play a six game. If you guys want, all I need is like a peanut butter, jelly sandwich, pack the fuck, you know, pack the Gatorades up mom. And then it's just funny as you get older in your baseball career, it's like they change the game time from seven Oh five to seven ten. those monsters. Yeah, it's insane. It really is. And as a kid, like you said, you, you don't care if you play three or four games a day in the 100 degree heat. Who who actually cares about it are the parents having to be at the field all day long. But I'll say this, these these parents are savages. They've got their coolers packed up with Mick Ultras, with high noons, yeah. white claws, you name it. Everybody's got a Yeti. They got the big Yeti chairs. They're locked in. But being at the field for nine, 10 hours is tough as a parent, but the kids don't give a shit. It's like, give me two hot dogs in between games, a Gatorade, maybe a Snickers and some Skittles, and then they're ready to go. Can you tell, like, are there kids out there where you're like, oh, that kid's definitely going to be good in college or like that kid, like that kid looks like he's like at 10 years old. Do you know who's good? You can kind of tell. It's it's tough, though. These kids are like pre puberty, so you never know what's going to happen over the next couple of years. Some of them aren't going to grow much at all. And then there's other kids that are going to grow spurt and end up being being six, five and might turn into some real players. Parents think that their 10 year old kid is already destined for the major leagues. And they always ask me, what does he got to do to throw harder? Should he throw a curveball? No, none of that shit. He, you need to let him continue to refine his skills, play multiple sports, yeah, and see what happens. I, I play Little League with hundreds and hundreds of kids, and only a couple of them even went on to play college baseball. So, yeah, they, they might be superstars now or studs. You just got to let them grow, let them develop, and just let them have fun playing the game. Do they need to go to all these showcases and, and this and that? No. I tell these parents. You get exposure from me. I can call any coach you need, get him exposed to any college. Why the hell are you going to send him to Florida to play in some showcase mm -hmm. where he gets to hit a bucket of balls and, and gets a free T-shirt? You know what I'm saying? Like, it's unnecessary. I mean, fuck, I'm, I'm coaching the team. 
I, like what, what, what do you need exposure for? Right. So we could do like a starting nine development camp or something. We just start flagging these kids early. Like you got the eye. You don't need to be sending these kids to Florida. Like right, right here. House at Jake. We know who we know who's worth what. We know how to get better here. So. If he's good, he's going to get seen. Period. Yeah. And my dad always told me he said, if you're good enough, teams will find you. I'm like, Dad, you know what? You got you have a good point. You have a so great point. That's a great point because I like at least in my experience playing, there'd be so many of these kids where it's like they're from small towns, you know, like a thousand people or whatever. And all they did was just dominate. And later in the week, we're going to, we have this great interview with Kevin Gossman coming. And there's this cool part in the conversation where he's talking about like, yo, it's not till I'm in the big leagues that I realize like I have to change a little bit. Cause like, you're just so good and dominant through, you know, high school and college and then into the minors and stuff where like, you don't actually have to consciously, think like how much better do I need to get to succeed at the big league so it's just like a different continuum for a lot of people I think it's really interesting the players that go through the adversity very early on so these like pre-puberty kids that maybe when they're 14 like they still haven't hit it yet but because they've been playing the game so much like the footwork's good the hand's good the knowledge of the game is good and then all of a sudden it's like hey you're 16 17 years old nobody's ever talked about you you just hit a growth spurt and now all the scouts are fucking standing there and you've got this makeup where it's like well no you have the chip on your shoulder like you you got it when you were 15 some guys don't ever get the chip some guys you know like again going back to the gossman conversation maybe it's not a chip on the shoulder but like that that sense of like i gotta fucking take control of this stuff happen later for him so i mean the, the little league the, the youth baseball movement is crazy man it's so intense most young players too or, or any player for that matter has some sort of chip on their shoulder they were told they couldn't do something or they weren't good enough to play on varsity as a as a sophomore or junior whatever the case might be i think 99.9 percent .9 of collegiate and professional athletes have, have that to a certain extent whether it was like i said a coach or a scout or somebody just said that they couldn't do something and i think we all need that it it, it gives you something to to prove and you know, to show that you actually can do it. And if you don't end up making it or having the skill set or the size or whatever it is necessary to, to make that, that jump, at least you, hopefully at least you got the most out of your ability. And if, if you could make it at the end of the day, then hopefully you could, you could live with that and kind of move on. So, and there's a lot of kids that will throw 80 miles an hour or 75 miles an hour, their freshman or sophomore year. Then they, they go away for, for the winter or, or a year, and they come back throwing 90, 92. It happens every year. Uh, there's young players that, that grow late and develop, you know, on, on their own, their own timeline and, and turn into, you know, studs later on, you know, in their adolescence and into their late teen years. So if you love the game, stick with it. Cause you never know what can happen physically. Amen. I'm living, honestly, we have the new setup. You're living me. proof. I like that jersey should not exist. I'm not even Joe as a bullpen catcher in high school. Like these Ron Karkovice batting gloves are random, but I love rock. That's a side step. But like it is just stick. Like I loved it enough where I was like, yeah, whatever. I'll figure it out. But if you love it enough too, then it allows you to be delusional to reality. And like a lot of baseball players need to be delusional in order to Absolutely. get to the next step. It's like, yeah, I was, I'm supposed, I legitimately thought that I was supposed to pitch for the University of Illinois. Like I didn't think I didn't have like, aspirations outside of college baseball but when i was on that team i was like this is my fate like of course i'm supposed to be here. what if you didn't have that mindset you probably would have never pitched for that team because there's you know how many guys are walking around that campus that throw 84 miles an hour there, there's like a hundred 150 guys on any big college campus that are like yeah i was the i pitched in high school i throw 83 84 i have a little bit of a spinner like that's not that fucking unique for me it was just like an, an obsession and obviously i the same thing goes to you you're borderline the craziest baseball player i've ever met when i was in high school it was you know strangely enough i i was never the best pitcher on my team even in high school we had a couple guys that threw mid to upper 90s a kid named eric reidner moved from florida to play at my high school it was a big high school we had some first rounders and some big picks and he comes in I believe he came in my junior year and it's our first inner squad and I'm facing him and he's six, four, six, five, throwing like 95, 96 miles an hour. And I'm in the box. Like, what is this? You know, I, I threw, I was like 88 to 90, 91 touch 92, my junior year. And I probably jumped it up another mile an hour or two, but, but nothing crazy. And then I go to Weatherford for my first year of college and I started throwing 98. So you never know when it can happen. Yeah. If it happens. 
And the, I mean, I didn't want it. Like I have the, we're going to get to some weekend news, but you bring up the junior college year. I've never heard you address this. Like it, it, you wanted to go to Juco because you liked baseball that much. Was there a scholarship reason where like TC was like, Hey, if you go this for a year, we have more money for you the second year. No, like, I, how- I didn't even talk to TCU until the summer after my freshman year uh, in college at Weatherford junior college. And I was drafted by the Reds out of high school. And I just physically, mentally, I, I wasn't ready to go. I knew that I still had room to grow. I was probably going to get bigger and stronger and throw a little harder and learn how to pitch on a, at a higher level. And that's what happened. So I, I went to Weatherford for a year. I started throwing a lot harder. Still really didn't know how to pitch that well. I had good breaking stuff. I had really no change up. I threw one. To, I walked too many guys, but I threw hard. So then I was drafted by the Brewers. I pitched in the Texas Collegiate League that summer and kind of walked into a scholarship at TCU uh, on, by accident. Uh, Jim Sloshnagel came to the game to watch our closer throw and didn't get to watch him throw because I threw a shutout and basically offered me what was basically almost a full ride scholarship to TCU that day. And uh, I'm like, are, are you sure about this? Let me let mm-hmm. me talk to my parents, but I, I think we can make this work. Bro, I love the stories of like the scout was there to see this guy and they ended up seeing this guy. And those things, those things happen all the time in baseball where like you get to take advantage of opportunities. That's what they say. Like you never know who's watching you in baseball. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's like a saying in basketball and football and other sports, but like in baseball, that's like a big mantra when you're a young baseball player going through the system. Like, Hey, you don't know who's here. You don't know who's watching. Always hustle on and off, always do all that bullshit. And, uh, that's crazy. He goes to see the closer and you just throw a nine, just like complete game shutty. The closer's like, dude, you just took my scholar. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, it was, uh, it was, it was luck. It was yeah. absolute luck. Just right time, right place. You know, and if I would have gotten knocked out of the game in the third or fourth inning, you never know what happens. I might've had a shitty rest of the summer and ended up going to, you know, junior college for another year. But, you know, either way I would, I would have stuck with it and hopefully made it. But, yeah, just things aligned and and it worked out for me. So I think that's a good jumping point into our weekend stories. Um, the big there's a lot of big stories. I want to start here though, because here's a guy who absolutely might be in his in his class and age, like the number one guy of like the scouts are gonna come and show up and see me and they get to see you too because you play with me. And that's Adley Rushman. Adley Rushman gets called up to the big leagues. This is a guy who probably could have been called up to the big leagues a year ago with how well he's performed at AAA and how athletic he is behind the play and everybody just rave reviews. It's like complete, you know, like hype, phenom hype, generational type catcher. And uh, I get excited about this stuff, but then I know I'm telling it to you. He makes his debut, he looks good. It is a dime a dozen, though. The phenom comes up. Are you sick of this stuff? Do you do you do you like when a number one prospect calls up? Is it something that kind of registers with you? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I was uh, very close to a situation like this in Baltimore. You know, Matt Weeters was uh, the Orioles first round pick uh, in 2007, my draft year. And he was I'm sure that that Adley is has been hyped just as much as as Matt Weeters was. And I played with Weeters in Frederick. We actually lived together uh, with a couple other prospects with Brandon Irby and Brandon Snyder and Weeters first two at bats. He goes uh, Oppa Homer from the right side and then Oppa Homer from the left side. It's like, who the hell is this guy? Like he's the best baseball player I've ever seen. So the Orioles fans are used to. Well, I wouldn't say used to, but they've been in this situation before with a very high profile catcher uh, in Weeders. But from what I've seen, I mean, he's got a beautiful left handed swing. Uh, his minor league numbers are great. What the Orioles are going to need from him, and I'm, I'm hoping that they have all the resources and support around him because he's going to he's going to need to be able to handle the starting staff basically immediately. He's 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 going to have guys around him. They're going to help kind of show him the way. Uh, but from everything I hear, he's, he, he has, he has very high character. He's got a good head on his shoulders and he's up for the challenge. And the advice I saw a quote from Weeders that just said, play hard, play often and play for your teammates. Um, so, you know, coming from a guy who was in the same situation that Adley is, um, it's, uh, it's good to have a guy like that, that you can, you know, hopefully, hopefully go to, to talk to, uh, when, when things, uh, come up that you're that you need some insight on but I, I think Adley's going to have a great career ahead of him uh, and just judging by the way he swings the bat I, I think he definitely will yeah 
Hopefully. I like when the Orioles are better. It's just one of those teams. I like, I like, a, I want everybody to be good and competitive. And Ali Rushman's like a guy who can really kind of be the first person out of the Orioles. They've got a good farm system and, you know, they've been going through it, but it's hard. Cause again, we're going to talk to Gossman on Thursday. And like, it just comes up with you two where it's like, Oh, we're fucking top Orioles pitching prospects. And like, you literally had to get the, you had to get as far away from them as possible for you to kind of realize exactly how good you could be in the game. So hopefully the Orioles are kind of passing that a little bit. It's, it's very unfortunate that things happen the way they did in, in Baltimore and Baltimore isn't the only organization that has had super high profile prospects, you know, come through the organization, get to the big leagues and, and struggle, have success, struggle, and then end up going somewhere else and, and figuring things out. Uh, part of it is that this game's really hard. Not everybody's going to get to the big leagues in, in a, in a timely fashion and, and have success right away and, and never go back to the minor leagues. It just speaks to the, the challenges you face at that level, trying to learn on the fly and trying to get the best hitters in the world out. But for whatever reason, they've had a, a very difficult time developing arms and, I know that there's probably not the same guys in place that there were when I was in the organization. Um, so hopefully they can turn things around because um, they definitely need to, especially in a division like that. It's not getting any easier. Yeah. That's the next point. Red Sox are red hot. I mean, they're just like nine of the last 12, I think two weeks ago or maybe in the first, yeah, maybe in the first, first week of the show, I was like, are they a trade candidate now? This is a team. You know, they went out and spent a bunch of money this offseason. It was one of those things, if they could get the starting pitching to match up with the lineup, you know, this team could be ferocious. And then you see the starting pitching go out and, and dominate for a little bit. And now the lineup's caught up a little bit. We're going to get to some specific players later. But, you know, kudos to the Red Sox because we said the AL East is not one of these divisions. You want to be going in mid-June, you know, trying to still figure your shit out. So if the Red Sox turn it around now, like that's – like I said, credit to them. That was a, like a little, I don't want to say make or break, but it was a moment in the season for Red Sox where, um, you know, it could have gotten fucking ugly in there. They've turned around nine and three in their last 12. Well, they're going to have to because they're, I believe they're 10 games back. The division's not going to get any easier, especially once it continues to start heating up, the bats get hot. We're going to need to see it for at least another couple of weeks to, to believe that there can be any consistent, um, you know, progression with that, with that offense and with, with the starting rotation and everybody needs, everybody needs starting pitching. Everybody needs a, a solid lineup. So it, it's easy to say that, right? Because you have, you have the Yankees, you have Tampa, you have Toronto and they're not going to slow down. So again, yeah, nine of the last 12, but we're going to need to see it for at least a couple more weeks to, you know, to believe that they're legit. Not to do a big schedule look ahead, though, if you were going to get on a heater, you were going to keep a, a, some momentum going. They, they are off today. There's three in Chicago at the White Sox. It, that is tough. I'm not saying that's easy. But then they got <laughs> – this is great. They got five at home in a row, Friday, Saturday. They have Friday, doubleheader Saturday, Sunday, Monday, against Baltimore. Then they've got two at home against Cincinnati, three on the road at Oakland. They could – you know, we could be having this conversation two weeks from now. We're like, hey, did you know the Red Sox went 22-5 and five over there? Uh, we'll see. We'll see. You still got to play those games. You know, Carl, and – what happens after that? Okay, hey, we beat teams that we're supposed to beat. Now we got to play really, really good teams. Now do we just go back to losing those games? Yeah. And you and you got to show up and 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 perform even against you know Oakland, Cincinnati, Baltimore. Uh, Baseball is a game where a starting pitcher can come out and and shove it up your ass. So it's it's that's why I don't put a lot into like the strength of schedule because you still got to show up. You still got to play nine innings and, and, and see where, you know, where the chips fall. So yeah, they, they should, they should do fine in that stretch, but then, you know, there's some big boys behind them. So, you know, take care of business then. And you still have to kind of continue to, to be teams. If you want to even hang around and 10 games back, that's no easy wow. task to try and make up, especially, you know, at, at this point in the season. Yeah. You almost have to ask, basically beg for some help, you know, you know, somebody's hamstring, you know, a little, you got to yeah. catch some breaks. You're going to have to catch. You know, some yeah. Breaks. You never want to never want to hope that guys get injured, but injuries are a big part of the game with such a long season guys will get hurt, but that can also, you know, happen to your ball club where it could put you even, even further behind the eight ball. 
What about uh, okay? Did you see Yachty and Pujols pitching? Is is that something <laughs> like? It seems like position players pitching becomes much more common now. I I, I have my own personal opinions about Yachty and Albert Pujols and how much they've harmed my child and young adulthood. I'm gonna still put love those them aside though. to you talk still about love them. I do you love, them. love I do guys. love them. I I love to see it. You don't see it very often when you're winning. And I think both of them pitched in wins. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's, uh, that's different. I didn't expect Yachty to throw the way he did. I thought he'd put a little bit more on it, but th then again, that just shows you like how difficult pitching really is. Uh, you know, the more effort you add makes it a little bit harder to throw strikes. My favorite part of it was, was seeing pools behind the plate, you know, catching Yachty's warmups. I mean, two guys, two legends in the game, St. Louis legends, uh, nonetheless. And, and look what Pujols is doing at the plate still. It's just, like, oh. it's just, it's just amazing. He, he might play for another four or five years. I really wonder how much environment matters. Cause I, I, I heard from very close sources. He had a really hard time in all the years he's out in Los Angeles and really being a part of like the culture and stuff and, and them building around him because when he's in St. Louis, he's the Godfather, you know, everything kind of floats through his schedule. Everybody's super respectful. And it's just interesting to see a guy who everyone is so quick to, I'm not so quick, but I mean, in Colin, Tell me if I'm wrong. I feel like your perspective on this too. You you come in from my position where like as fans, you watch him. It was sad to see Albert Pujols just become a, a ground ball double play machine and so it's just a complete different version of what we knew. And now he's back in St. Louis. You just have to wonder how much do like the good vibes actually matter. I also think though, if you're gonna be out in LA, like that's a tough team to be on, regardless of the player you are. Like the people in that lineup is just one through nine, they're just nasty. You know what I mean? So if, especially if you're on the tail end of your career, like it's not gonna be easy to just fit in with those guys who are just like raking and producing every single day. So I mean, it might be just a comfort thing, like you're saying, and it's working out for him still. Well, it kind of looks like that, you know, Pujols has been almost been on the tail end of his career for for a while. He's been playing for a long, long time. And, you know, the bat speed is obviously slowed down. Physically, he's not near where he used to be. But somehow he's still finding a way to at least produce enough to be on a major league roster and a, a team like the St. Louis Cardinals, nonetheless. And I'm sure being back with Yachty and in that ballpark helps, helps a little bit. You know, he's obviously very comfortable there. He loves that city. The city loves him. So it's it's definitely not going to hurt. It's also, yeah, I mean, you said it. it it's kind of cool. I do respect the shit out of these guys. I mean, Cubs fan of shit aside, like as a just baseball guy, what, what Yachty did, has done with pitching staffs, whoever deserves the credit, he's the one catching the mother. You know, he's the one catching them. And then, you know, obviously Pujols. What, what, that guy – that guy will deserve like several. There should be 30, 30 for 30s on that guy. On um, it's just crazy how dominant that guy was. Uh, there's, there's from two notable guys in a, in a kind of a fun story. There's not a great story this weekend, but we absolutely have to talk about it. It's, it's Tim Anderson and Josh Donaldson. And so if you were unaware, wait for the weekend, or you've just caught a little bit or snippets, uh, basically, story goes Josh Donaldson had, uh, had set, had called. Uh, Tim Anderson, Jackie, when he went to second base in the first inning, and he did it again, I believe, in the third inning. And that was like a reference to Jackie Robinson and the White Sox, you know, Yaz, huge brawl erupted. And, um, you know, the White Sox obviously re reacted very strongly to it. Um, bench is clear. Josh Donaldson then goes out to the media. I should say the White Sox go to the media say what Josh Donaldson had said it had disclosed he was calling Tim uh Tim Anderson Jackie Josh Donaldson then responded to the media and said hey it's just it's an inside joke you know we're, this is a joke between us and you know I I've, I've made this joke before and I'm surprised he's you know I'm surprised he is responding about this and then the white Sox of the clubhouse has come back and just said Josh Donaldson's full shit and I'll I'll read the Liam Hendricks quote that I think is um is is particularly spot on he said uh, usually you have inside jokes with people you get along with not people that don't get along at all that statement right there was complete bullshit it sounds like the white Sox are, are pretty firm in that they don't you know that that they think josh donaldson's full of shit and 
Um, you know, I'm obviously interested in your opinion about this. I, I think it's yeah. just ridiculous. I think it's, I think it's a ridiculous fucking thing. If, if, if what we're, if what we know about this is true and, um, you know, it's just like, it's, it's, it's way, it's way past the threshold of Bush league. Uh, it's just like, it's, it's honestly ridiculous. We're even talk, that it's ridiculous. If, if it transpired the way that what we know is true, then like this, this is fucking stupid. This is ridiculous. I, Josh yeah. Allison. I think the biggest mistake that he made was saying that it was an inside joke i think everybody a part that's that's aware of the situation knows that that's that's not the case um why he called uh tim anderson jackie probably thinks that that's that's overly arrogant uh and just kind of making fun of him i don't think um that it was really anything anything race related i just think that it's like oh really like you, you think you're jack you think that highly of yourself to call yourself jackie robinson Yes, because um, because in 2009, what, 2019 or 2020, when there is a big uh, Tim Anderson was really in the news before he was uh, as big of a name he is now. This is when the Tim Anderson was really like coming onto the scene and, you know, the White Sox overshadowed by the Cubs at this time. And he's kind of coming out. Not a lot of people nationally know who Tim Anderson was. He had a home run against the, Ro the Royals, threw his bat down. There was a big, big controversy. And, and in those comments afterwards, he had he had ex described and explained himself that he sees himself as like a modern day Jackie Robinson. And that's an exact quote from Tim Anderson where yes. he said, and I, I don't see yeah. myself as, I see myself as Jackie. So, and I have no problem with that at all. Like I, I love right. Tim Anderson. I think he's unbelievably fun to watch. And I like some of the, um, some of the controversy, you know, not that I want to see, you want to see anybody get hurt. I like when benches clear a little bit. I like when players get, get at each other's throats. And I think the fans do too. I think, uh, again, like I said, I think the biggest uh, mistake that was made was, was Donaldson saying it was some sort of inside joke. Um, you know, maybe, maybe be honest about, about that. Liam Hendricks had a great quote and I think that 99% of the people involved believe that that's the case. You know, if, if it rises to the, if, if Tim Anderson feels that it, that it was a racist move from Josh Donaldson and he has conviction and, and all this stuff, then like Tim Anderson's well within his right to say to Josh Donaldson and make this a big deal. I think that's how, I think that's what it is. But in Josh Donaldson's case, you know, I don't know his character or anything. He does, he can point back and say, this is what, this is how Tim Anderson's referred to him in the past. And, you know, in locker rooms, we rolled our eyes at it because Jackie Robinson is such a, you know, historic figure within the game of baseball and sports and really just fucking human civilization. Like there, there is this way where like I can see Josh Donaldson getting into second base and calling him Jackie because it's like, who the fuck do you think you are? Like you think you're fucking Jackie Robinson? And now? I can almost guarantee you yeah. that that's that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Um, but but yeah, I mean it doesn't doesn't make it something that that Tim uh, Tim was comfortable with him him saying to him, you know. And then when when I saw Donaldson walk up to the plate and Yasmani Grandal kind of gave him an earful and Donaldson really had nothing to say, you know, maybe he realized, okay, I, I, I was wrong in the situation. Cause you, you guys saw that too. Like Donaldson was, was pretty quiet during that entire confrontation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He wasn't like piping up. Like it wasn't mm, it, the white Sox will do the white Sox have each other's back. That's a tight team. That's a tight lineup. Those guys get along. Tim Anderson's a leader in the clubhouse. Like he definitely has the pulse of that team very much. And, um, and the other thing too, Tim Anderson's like, a, he ball, he's fucking balls out. He plays his ass off. I know this living in Chicago, watching him play up and it. Like he, that guy competes his dick off the white Sox fans. Like you, good luck finding a white Sox fan to say a bad word about Tim Anderson. And I mean, the people that watch him every day, they really, uh he's he's somebody that's like beloved in chicago and stuff so yeah i, I think the that, only people that yeah. don't like him are probably fans on teams that have to play him a lot and just probably wish that he was on their team because you know from a baseball perspective and just from from a fan perspective watch watching a play he's he's electric you know and and, and the personalities there and i think a lot of the young kids gravitate towards players like that and and the game needs needs guys like that He's sweet. I'll say that. I throw that. That's a, that's a, that's a compliment I use for baseball players specifically. Like he's sweet. Like he's got swag. He fucking has power to the oppo field. He makes sweet plays. He's got a cool throwing motion. He's athletic. He looks good in the flat bill, the number seven, like to, to, Tim Anderson is very much the direction of where I like to see major league baseball go with these just like athletic superstars. And Colin, your point, the three run Homer, nothing shuts Yankee stadium up like a big fuck you sandwich.
Um, okay, needless to say, Josh Donaldson is probably not eligible for awards this week. I don't think we'll be giving Josh Donaldson any awards, but we do have awards to give out, Jake. We have we this, do. this is Tuesday. We have a full week of baseball behind us. Um, we're gonna give out some awards and and I want you to I want you to lead it off. All right, so bag of the week, you know, mm. big, big, heavy nutsack. Okay. And this guy is gonna be in charge of helping this team continue to roll make progress and if they're trying to trying to climb the standings this guy is one of the main game changers in that lineup trevor story numbers aren't overall as good as he would like or, or any fan of the red sox but seven home runs in his last 11 games with two huge games four for five three homers seven rbis and then the next night added added four more rbis to that i think he's hitting about 225 226 he's a phenomenal hitter Talk about great athleticism. He's one of those guys. He's too good to continue, um, you know, with those numbers overall. He's going to he's going to pick those numbers up, and his power is going to be there. There's just no, you know, people said, oh, you get him out of Colorado, he's not going to hit for power. That's bullshit. This guy's got pop. He's got a great eye. And, you know, obviously what he can do on defense is, is a plus. So, Trevor Story, my bag mm -hmm. of the week. Mm -hmm. Do you think he shaves his balls? Yeah, absolutely. Come on. Yeah. I mean, just saying, like, he, he's keeping him. Yeah. Well, he shaves his arms, and, you know, he, he looks he looks pretty slick. You know, I've, I saw him up close in Arlington a couple of weeks weeks back. Yeah, he's smooth. Yeah. I like that. That's a good award. Now, if people are going to accuse us that we're doubling down or that we don't. We don't necessarily no, I, put this together like a pr big pre-production meeting. You're in charge of the bags. I'm in charge of the dudes. We and haven't even talked about it. Our dude of the week is Trevor Story. <laughs> no I mean, shit. You Come can't on. you can't be as dominant as he was this year. Yeah, because you have the bag. To me, is the reason he's got the big bag, and I is the Red Sox are down. You need somebody to step up. Have to. They're, two big second baseman free agents this year. There is Marcus Simeon and then there is Trevor Story. Now, if I miss somebody else along, those are the two big swinging dicks, okay? Marcus Simeon got a little bit more money, a little bit more years, go down to Texas, and uh, and he's been absolutely terrible. Trevor Story was brutal until a little bit ago. He got extremely, extremely hot this this week. He slugged 1,150 or something. Yep. Yeah, that's insane. That means he's getting, he's, he's getting more than one total base per per at bat which is uh which is insane he walked more than he struck out obviously the weighted on base the slugging all that stuff the way it runs created play you look at all the data and all this stuff it's incredible the power i want to focus on a statistic that will come back for saber fucking metrics uh is isolated power but the reason he's a dude is as simple as this he got the fucking bag of money this offseason he's been walking around it's a hard place to play Everybody's been waiting for Trevor Story to get going. Everybody. Now, mm -hmm. bag is more for the team and stepping up for the team, dude. And at home, in front bro. of your, in front of your crowd, you know. Sweet, big, flashy free agent second baseman, the first ever co-winner, dude, and bag of the week, Trevor Story. Congratulations, Red and this Sox might just be dogs. something that'll keep him going. This this could be something that just keeps him rolling and keeps him hot. You know, he'll hear about this. Yeah, that he's actually. I'm I wouldn't. Text him. Yeah, get 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 the word out to Trevor and. Um, well, and look at this too, Carl. So imagine like you're in you're in Boston, like you said, tough place to play. You're hitting like shit, no power. He didn't hit his first home run until ten or eleven games ago. That's that's gonna wear on you. You're even if you don't read the media directly, you hear the shit. You hear fans in the in the stands, home and road, just just dogging you, wearing you out. You you know you haven't been good. You want to be better. You give a lot. You give a lot of the money back to have better numbers. I've talked to a lot of guys about that in in the past. Yeah, the money's great, but I would rather have numbers. I'd rather perform. I don't want to hear people talking shit because I suck. I know I suck. Here, here's fifty million. Let me let me hit two eighty. Like that, that's just, that's just a fact. So for him to kind of put that shit aside, come out and, and put up some numbers, you know, that's what, that's, that's why he won two awards. We got one more award. Uh, I may take it off. I may take the head off. It's bald, bald guy of the week. Ooh, yeah. I know. Not great. 
Miles Teller told me. I haven't forgotten about it. Um, ball guy of the week. Colin, do you have any guess? You? No. Fuck me. <laughs> he didn't do fuck shit. me. Our ball guy of the week is Shane Victorino. Shane Victorino slid into the starting nine comment Shane. section this past week, leaving some nice comments for us on Instagram. He's enjoying the starting nine podcast, the products out there. I was a huge Shane Victorino guy when he was going that year he had in Boston in 2013 might be one of the greatest value free agent acquisitions of all time. He was a captain. He was the leader, the flying Hawaiian Shane Victorino is one of those names you forget about. And then you hear the name and you just remember how dynamic and awesome he was. He was a low profile guy. And, and as, I check up to date Shane Victorino. I I think he is living in Hawaii, but he's a huge, huge golfer now. We love big golf. Golfer, he's big very ball. Yeah, it's big, big friend, big friend of the show at this point. Yeah, let's 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 get him on the course. Okay, he could probably get get in touch with Jordan, get us some get us some nice golf shoes. Maybe even we'll head out. Uh, we'll head out west. Go meet him in Hawaii. I would be, I have time in the calendar too, for that. Like a lot of stuff I'm too busy for, but like I can, I didn't have time to go to the gym yet today. I will be going later, but like Hawaii, I got nothing but time for that. I can make, yeah, I can make that work. Especially after baseball season with Cooper's over, I'm there. I'm there. Let's stay on golf for a second. I want to do a little Jake explains here. This is one of my favorite segments we have. This is where you just kind of explain something to me, who's somebody who looks at the outside of my outside of major league baseball. I'm like, man, I wonder what's going on inside the clubhouse. This is a segment where Jake just makes it super simple for a guy like me to understand. The weather is nice across the United States forecast through the roof. We talk about golf with Shane Victorino. So Jake, explain to me now that like, you know, wherever you're going, Cleveland, Chicago, Seattle, that you're going to have great golfing weather. Can you explain to me now when you get in town, who sets up the tee times and what's that process like behind the scenes? I do. I set it all up and shout out to all the, all the great connections and golf courses around, around the country that I've played and will continue to play. And I, I always network and, and like to meet people and get up early. I, I stress it to young players all the time and still do get as much sleep as you can. And then have the, you, you want to have the ability to wake up, especially if you have an, an off day. I know position players don't typically like to play golf a lot, which is fine. Cause they got to grind. They're there at two o'clock, seven o'clock game. They're home late and they got to post the next day. But if you're a starting pitcher and you like the game of golf, start making it a habit to play golf in some of these cities. You get to travel from East Coast to West Coast. You're in, you know, you're in the Midwest. You come south to Texas. You're in Georgia. Some of the best golf in the world is right here in this country. You need to get to know people. Get out of the hotel. Quit fucking sleeping in until one o'clock and going to the field. You're wasting your day. You're wasting your time. And there's great people out there to meet. And there's a lot of bogeys to be made, Carl. Am I right? <laughs> yeah. No, I, 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 pars are lame. Give me a good five any day of the week. I'll t uh, yeah, I'm, I'm great at bogeys and I don't even care. I just like to play the game of golf. I can shoot a 77 or a 97 and there's nothing wrong with that. There's really nothing wrong with that. So each team has like, is it a pitcher? Each team's going to have a pitcher where it's like, Hey, I'm going to set it. Like there's a, there's like a de facto leader within like a team of like, all right, we're in Chicago. I'll set it up. You know who the golfers are. Yeah. Yeah. You usually yeah. know. And even before you join a team, you'll probably know. Like when I was, um, you know, in, in Chicago early on, uh, I, I had some pretty good golf connections, but then, you know, Lester came in and he, he knew just about everybody and connections he didn't have. I gave to him and vice versa. And, when teams would come in town, you know, there's guys that, you know, on other teams, like, uh, you know, hit guys up, you know, with the Phillies and say, Hey, let's, I, I got a tea time at, at Butler. Or I got a tea time at LA country club or Bel Air or wherever, wherever the hell we're at. I, I like to spread the wealth. So it's kind of like, you know, paying for team dinners. It's, it's no different with golf. You want to, you want to show young guys golf courses if they like golf uh, and you want to pay it for it because, you know, now I'm out of the game and I still get texts, um, you know, multiple times a week, like, Hey, where should I play golf in, in Atlanta? Or where should I play golf in Miami? Well, Hey, uh, I'm glad you brought that up because here's three or four guys I can connect you with and, uh, you know, in, enjoy the round make sure you tip the caddy. Okay. That's, uh, that's something I got to make sure they know. Don't fucking don't stiff your caddy. Of all the things of like, I mean, obviously like, you know, the pro sport, like, oh, the contracts or the fucking five-star hotels, the private jets, and just kind of like the notoriety or whatever. To me, it's like, dude, you just like, 
the amount of quality is walk onto a golf course and go have some fun with the boys. Like that's, that to me is like the number one perk. Uh, maybe, maybe I'm exaggerating too, but it's just golf season. I got, I got the, butt. I got the buck, man. It is. And I got a story for you. I, it just popped in my head and it was one of the best days of golf that I've ever had. That was ruined. Yeah. It ended up turning, turning out fine. All right. So in Chicago, we're playing, uh, we're playing the nationals. I go play Robert Trent Jones with two of my good buddies. Ian Happ uh, comes with us, uh, Zach Davies and Craig Kimbrell. And this happened to be the same day that Craig Kimbrell was traded. So we were playing and I wasn't supposed to pitch for like two days. So, you know, I get there. I have a tequila grapefruit, obviously. I tee off at like 8, 8.15. Tequila grapefruit tastes, tastes amazing, like Miles told you. So before we teed off, I had two, two doubles, I believe. And they'll, they'll send out airstrikes. So they're sending out airstrikes. I was probably four or five in at the turn, had four or five more to finish the round. We had a beautiful day. And Robert Trent Jones in Virginia, the back nine holes are all on this private lake. So it's, it's one of the best walks in golf. The course is in great shape. I believe it was in June or something like that. It was hot. So we're in the Uber back to the hotel. Kimbrell's on the phone with, I think he was on the phone with Jed Hoyer. So he just got traded. And then I get a fucking text from David Ross, or I get a phone call from David Ross. And he goes, hey, um, can you start today? And I like, I put the phone away and I'm like, like, fuck you, David. And I'm like, you know what? Yeah, yeah, I, I can start today. And he, I, I don't know if he knew I played golf or not, whatever the case was. So I'm like, yeah, I'm like 10, 10 drinks deep, but I'm, I'm going to start. So I was kind of pissed off at Rossi, but I get it. So I get to the field late. I got to the field at like 430, splash some water on the face, started my routine, ended up, you know, going five, five or six innings, gave up one run. But yeah, I was, I was pretty heated at, at, at Rossi for that one. But what am I going to do? Tell him, no, I can't pitch. No, dude, you absolutely have to take the mound. And I think some people have said before, I've heard that, like, if you take the mound under, like, maybe you've had too much to drink the night before, like, you know, in this case, this is definitely the first time I'm hearing about a major league starter that's like, was, was asked the day of, like, if you could start and you had, like, hey, I had a couple pops in you, but like, um, I've yeah, more than a couple. I mean, it was probably, it was probably 10. I've heard though that that, that the reason it helps is because you're like, get me off the fucking mounds. You just find yourself pitching more aggressively. You're like, the, you're just ready. Like, I don't want to be out here. Just get me off this fucking mound. And so pitchers will say like, yeah, I was pitching more to contact or like, you know, I just had it. I just had like better stuff. Something, something was getting me off the mound. The stuff definitely wasn't better. I mean, I commanded the ball fairly well. I only gave up a few hits. It, it was fine, but I had no business being out there, but I, you know, Hey, I'm not, I'm not, I'm never going to tell the guy I can't pitch. And threw the ball okay. Threw the ball all right. You don't have to name any names, but I mean, on topic, like, was you, have you heard any stories of guys that like were like, oh, that guy can't. He showed up to the field. He's too drunk. They had to move his start back or something. No, I mean, shit. There, no, nobody's dumb enough to drink on the day they pitch. I mean, other than other than me, I just happened not to know about it yeah. until fucking five hours before the game. Uh, we, we had a laugh about it. It, it was funny. Um, yeah. No, no, no. I mean. Look, starting pitchers know how to plan their their extracurricular activities accordingly. Typically, it's it's the night the night after, um, or you know, the night they pitch, they'll they'll enjoy themselves, and then maybe like you know maybe the next night or, or the bullpen day they'll have a few, but then you know most guys are really good about getting two or three days pre start to to kind of get get recovered and and make sure they're ready to toe the rubber and. And go to work on the subject of recreational activities. There's a pitcher in major league baseball who has a lot more time for recreational activities over the next six to eight weeks. Colin, let's go to the, let's go to Colin's corner for the Mets. What's going on with Max Scherzer, bro. Uh, I mean, Scherzer, he's put on the 15 day DL. So he's got a left oblique injury. Like you said, six to eight weeks. We'll see uh, who they replace him with right now. They're saying potentially looking at Frankie Montas from Oakland's might have to put uh, Dom Smith in the package together. Um, I mean, we, again, I was saying to Jake earlier, we don't need an ace right now, but we need someone who's going to eat up some innings and just help us out get through the time. So 
But other than that, quick update in Mets land, uh, snowed out on Friday. That's not something you ever hear often in baseball. So that was pretty cool. It was 85 degrees on Thursday in Colorado. And then they got snowed out Friday. So uh, ended up swimming the doubleheader on Saturday, won the series on Sunday. Mets are now 13 games over 500, eight up on the division. Uh, cool little stat, the Rockies streak uh, came to an end. They had 84 straight games at Coors Field with two plus runs scored. The Mets held them to one run on Saturday in the first game, and then they shut them out on Sunday. So that's a hard thing to do going into Colorado. The Mets have won 14 consecutive games following a loss. That's the longest streak in the MLB in 11 years. And they have not lost two games in a row since April 10th and 11th. Very impressive. And we talked about that last week, I believe. Not losing consecutive games, like that's how you, that's how you build onto that division lead. Right. You go on a streak, you lose a game, fine. How do, we, uh, how do we start a new streak the next day? And the Mets have definitely found a way to do that. And Colorado, I don't know if people know this. If you go look at the data, you will find out over the last couple of years, Colorado is is just a step behind Tampa as far as tough places to play. Is that because people are smoking weed? Is that because it's just the it's just the 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 thin air that people have to talk about? What you go to Colorado, it's just like, oh, it's tough to play here. Or is it because they're like sneakily very, 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 very average? What what is it? <laughs> The Rockies have always been a difficult team to go in and play in that ballpark. For whatever reason, no matter how good or bad they are, they're tough to play at Coors Field. It just, it just is. I, I've never really found that the elevation had affected me when I was out there pitching physically. It does affect the way that the ball will spin. You have to change your sights a little bit on breaking balls and change-ups. All you got to do, you start it a little bit lower. That can be difficult for a guy who only pitches there once or a couple times a year to kind of learn quickly. But at, over the course of your career, you kind of figure that out. And if you get a bullpen session uh, before you get to pitch there, you can you can make the adjustment. But as as a uh, as a rocky starter, you definitely have the advantage. Even if you know, and I tell people this all the time you always hear that guys don't want to go sign as a starting pitcher to play in Colorado, this and that it's hard to pitch at the elevation. All you have to do is you have to out pitch the visiting, the visiting starter who only gets a couple starts there a year. So you definitely have the advantage. And you know, if you get, you get paid, you have the contract, you know, nobody wants to have, um, you know, a, a three and a, a high three or a four, they, their ambitions are, are much lower than that. But all you have to do is out pitch the, your opponent. And if, if you give up three and he gives up five or you give up four, he gives up six, you st you're still winning ball games for your team. So there is something to be said for the elevation. I think physically uh, it's, it's uh, blown out of proportion slightly, but there is something to it. Like I said, it doesn't matter if the Rockies aren't very good or not. They, they play well in that ballpark. It just, it's just like, I think Colorado, I think fucking, Colorado, I think Bichette, Helton, like there's it, they do have that brand and they have that uh, uh, like you're going in to play Iowa in college football. You know, they're going to run the ball and play good defense. Like who knows if they're like that? You just know what you're getting. And I just feel like the Rockies have always have always stayed on that. And and in particular, their power, like it's a, it's a place with a lot of power. And this is what I want to talk to you guys about Saber fucking metrics this week. I did some research on an advanced statistic that I would like to introduce to our audience that maybe you guys know, maybe you haven't known. Um, it pops up on the landing page when you go to fan graphs a lot, but it's not something that gets talked about in broadcast or very casually. And that's isolated power. It's a measurement of how many total bases are you hitting that aren't just singles. So like, it's a measurement of how often are you hitting a double, a triple or a home run? Because a lot of statisticians or, or sabermetric people will say that, you know, a double is more valuable than the single, which is more valuable than triple. Obviously that that shouldn't be fucking rocket science here. So isolated power is a, is a measurement here, guys. I did the research. Isolated power is a measurement, the raw power of a hitter by only considering extra base hits and the type of extra base hit. For example, a player who goes one for five with a double has an isolated power of 200, one for five with a double isolated power of 200, a player who goes two for five with a single and a double will have a higher batting average. 
but will also have an isolated power of 200 because it measures the total bases against the. Does this uh, have anything to do with slugging percentage, or is it is it yes. kind of similar to that? So how, here's how you get great questions, Jake. That's a great question. I'm learning this stuff too. I don't want to come across as I invented the fucking statistic. Oh, I, I if, knew that. If you take slugging percentage and you subtract batting average, you get isolated power. Oh, so it's not it's not a crazy advanced way to, that's to get one, to that number. That's okay. one way to get to it. You can also take it by the number of doubles, the number of two times the number of triples, three times home runs. Okay. Um, there's, there's some other metrics. Don't simplify this here, pal. This well, is so good, it's just, it's just here. taking, it's, it, it is a nice number. So it's basically just taking all of the singles out of the equation. Correct. Correct. It's taking, that's a very, it, yeah, you just made me sound like I, okay. Very, where you made that very easy for people to understand. So what, by getting rid of singles and you're able to like better identify exactly who are the power guys. I bring this up because Trevor Sori's isolated power this past week was 760. There's only four players in Major League Baseball history to qualify with an isolated power over 300. Babe Ruth, Barry Bonds, Mark McGuire, and active player is Manny Machado. No, active player is Fernando Tatis Jr. I got that wrong. I got I got my electric San Diego Padres confused here. So it's really, I mean, this is a number, the, the Major League average is 114, 115. Talk about Trevor Story having a 760 this past week. That is what really jumped out, obviously, with the home runs and stuff. I've enjoyed looking at isolated power when I'm looking to figure out, like, is this somebody who is benefits from being in the middle of a good lineup? Is this somebody who, you know, ran into some shitty pitching or just got hot for a second? Like, if you actually do want to know, like, all right, who are the real thumpers? And, I mean, you know from the eye test, but – just for the purposes, if you really want to boil it down and be like, how do you want to rank like who the true sluggers are? I like isolated power. I encourage you guys to check out isolated power. There you go. Well, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to do a better job of keeping an eye on that because I think that's, you know, that's very important. Like you said, to figure out like guys, guys in the middle of the order, did they just get hot for a brief period of time? Did they benefit from, you know, having guys around them? That's, that's all interesting stuff to look at. Shohei Otani leads the league. I'll just run through Otani. Some of the names. Tatis Jr., Bryce Harper. Surprises see Joey Votto up there because his batting average is low, but it just goes to show you when Joey Votto and this is, is putting this the bomb is this play, year or, or this is th this year. No, this is this is last no. year. This okay. is fucking last year. You fucking idiot, Carl. Well, I'm like Tatis. Come on, he ain't fucking he ain't playing <sighs> right now. Fucking idiot. That's okay. We get the idea though. Okay, let me give you the top. So Machado's Machado's got to be up there. Mike Trout, Judge, Jordan Alvarez, Bryce Harper, Jose Ramirez. How about Jazz Chisholm? All those doubles add up, guys. CJ Cron, who could be in the uh, – uh, or Cron, I should say, should be in the MVP consideration for the National League. Wisdom's up there. Rizzo's up there. So this guy's putting in play, extra base hit, guys. Um, I'll have more. We'll, we'll keep growing our sabermetric library. And as the show progresses, we're just going to get smarter and smarter. Come playoff time, we're going to be sitting here being like, did you see his defensive zone rating? Hopefully we don't turn yeah. into that type well, of show. Well, there's just so much knows. growth. So much growth taking place. Do you feel it? I do. I do. Uh, God, do I feel it too. Let's talk growth. Let's talk division standings for a second. This year is very interesting to me because there's there's disparity uh, between the top and the bottom. If you look right now, the average games back for teams is around four and a half across the division. There's a stretch there for a while through the first two months of the season from 2013 to 2017, where through the first two months of the season for five straight years, the average games back in the division was around 2.2 to 2.5 every single year. Now you're seeing this early in the season games back four and a half, five. And I think that has to do with teams are more likely to tank early. And then you're seeing more teams that, you know, who's at the top, you know, it's the Yankees, you know, it's the Dodgers. Yeah. I, what, what do you think about tanking, man? I think it takes on a lot of different forms. You're going to get to a point where you just have to give some young players more opportunities and see what you have. I mean, you're trying to win, but, you know, you're trying to win with what you have. So I, I don't know. I, I'm not a huge fan of that term. What 2013 I, Cubs, you get traded, you come over, they fucking trade Scott Feldman for you, like the classic tank of all time. Were you in the, like, when you got around that, those guys, or is it just like, yeah, nobody gives a fuck if we win or lose? Well, I don't, I don't think that Feldman was going to help the team reach the playoffs. So the, the Orioles were looking for an arm that could help them in the postseason, and that wasn't me. And the Cubs were looking for a guy that they could potentially get put into a new uniform. 
and see what they've got. So I, so, I don't necessarily think it's tanking. I mean, the Cubs at the, at the time were, were not a good team at all. All the talent, uh, a majority of the talent was, was in the, in the system. And then obviously they had plans to bring, bring certain free agents in, in the next year or two. They're just kind of waiting for their time, waiting for their opportunity to strike. So one thing I've learned in this show so far early on is that like, I would, I would have come in before t- talking to you and getting your insight and just to assume like that some guys just show up day and they're like, it doesn't matter. We're fucking, you know, sorry, we're 20 games below or, you know, I got plans and we're golfing or, you know, I'm already getting paid. And, and you're saying, you've said repeatedly, like everybody's showing up to do their best that day. Like there, there aren't guys that are really that much mentally checked out. Like people no. are competing to do their best, even if they're yeah. awful. Well, everybody's got it has something to prove you know you you only have to impress especially if a guy's going to be a free agent um or you know bench guys who are getting more opportunity than they than they would on a really good team they're trying to press the 29 other teams they're trying they're playing for they're playing for jobs next year young players are playing for a position on that roster uh, out of next spring training there, there's bullpen guys competing for spots and and the competition for spots doesn't only happen in spring training i mean there's uh you know it helps an organization a lot to, to watch guys in meaningful games and they're meaningful games because they're, they're real baseball games during the 162 game season. Even if the team's 20 games out, there's all, there's always something to play for. And yeah, maybe the season there's no, there's no ambition to, to make the postseason. but there's so many good things that can happen in a situation like that in Chicago in 2013. And obviously it led to some pretty good things over the next three or four years. Does that yeah, make I mean, sense? No, I, it, it's it's just hard to, like, capture when are these players coming up. And, like, that's why I don't – how do you know you're going to tank? Like, the for perfect example, it would be the 2015 season for the Cubs when you guys were at the All-Star break. And that's a season where it's, like, a little bit 500, a little bit below 500, some, some promising stretches and all that stuff. And then we had the, – the Cubs had been tanking for a couple of years – and I think just you were in the mode of watching the Cubs and like, all right, whatever, like 500 was good enough. And then August hits and then all of a sudden they're off to the races. And maybe you guys saw it in the clubhouse, but I know across baseball, generally speaking, people were very surprised by that. And that's the hard thing about tanking, because how do you know when to flip the switch? We talked about Adley Rushman getting called up to the Orioles. You know, they're 17. I think they're 17 and 25. You know, they've played pretty well. They have two walk-off wins against the Rays. They've shown that they're way more competitive they've been in years past. So you pull the trigger on Rushman now. Like, you know, what if they start playing? You know, what if they what if they get to 500 and it's mid-juniors? I'm not saying it's going to happen, but, like, then is it – then at the Orioles, like, are they fully committed to a tank this year or not? I don't know. I don't know. I, I just have a hard time with that term. Okay. Because – just because being in the clubhouse and seeing – watching guys go about their business and everybody – whether whether that that mindset is is happening in the front office or not in the clubhouse you know, the guys are guys are preparing to win that game no no matter what every every single guy the only thing that they care about is is performing as well as they can for for that group of guys to help to help win win the game and you know on certain teams like the Orioles and some of these other teams it's not going to happen very often, but I promise you that's the mindset. Is there frustration that, that mounts and, and builds up and, and things snowball and go and go in a direction that's, um, that's counterproductive at times? Yes. But at the end of the day, you know, players in the clubhouse don't care if, if the, uh, if the organization or front office has a certain, uh, mindset of, of tanking or, or doing this or that the players are just trying to win. Yeah. And again, I don't think fa- I don't I don't think the average fan thinks that. I think the average fan thinks like, oh, whatever, they melded it. Maybe maybe they did, but the players didn't. Mm-hmm. You know, the play like I like I said before, every everybody has something to play for. Everybody, you know, whether it's pride or a job for next year or to put up good numbers for, you know, whether you're just trying to put up good numbers so they look good on the back of your baseball card it doesn't matter what the reason is everybody's trying to trying to kick the, the other team's ass that they're playing you know so, sometimes just the teams aren't very good you know 
us or or you're playing against playing against the fucking Yankees or you're playing against you know the Mets and you know but but look at look at some of these other teams you know like like the Marlins the Marlins have a a shot to be really really good they're 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 one run away from you know being right there and so are the Braves and I'm not saying the Braves are some prospect laden team that hasn't been good for a while they have been really good obviously but there's some of these other teams that could easily win you know 10 of 12 and be right in the mix i don't necessarily think that the orioles are one of those teams based on the teams that they're stacked up against you know on a, on a nightly basis uh but i'd love to see the orioles be a good team i'd love to see the orioles you know chasing a pennant uh with with the top teams in that division i just you know I hope Adley has a phenomenal career. I hope he has a great rookie season this year. But is he is he single handedly gonna gonna change that that team? Uh, I, I don't think so. I need, I think they need a lot more than that. And I, they might have players there that are capable. They just need more production out of them. And I think they have some nice arms, but that lineup, frankly, just isn't gonna score enough runs to 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 stand up to the to those teams in their division. I just don't think it's possible. A couple of quick observations. You bring up Miami. Miami's got an 11 run plus 11 run differential or a plus 17 run differential. I should say mm-hmm. um, they're 18 and 22. Just for context, Tampa Bay has a plus 12 run differential. They're five runs worse in the season. They're 24 and 17. Like you say, it's like one run here. It's one bad game here. And the other thing that jumps out too, the Orioles are 12 and 17 against teams that have a record over 500. That's 29 of their 42 games against teams that are over 500 record. That is by far the most in the American league. Um, and it just speaks to the quality of the strength of the schedule and stuff like that. There's these little things. It's still early in the season. There's some schedule anomalies. It's still worth looking at the division standings. Uh, you look at it. There's a, the AL East, the NL West, very competitive. They're going to be competitive throughout the year. The NL East, you're seeing the Mets are kind of running away with things. I'd really like to just kind of focus on the AL Central and the NL Central today because the Brewers and the Cardinals, I feel like they're just going to be in a great heavyweight match. That's going to be a great story throughout the year. Can the Cardinals get hot enough to compete against the Brewers starting pitching over 162? And then obviously the White Sox and the Twins. The, 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 the longer the Twins keep a couple games ahead of the White Sox, the more I think the AL Central becomes very, very interesting. I guess if between those two, do you see a more interesting battle between the Twins and the White Sox or the Brewers and the Cardinals over like the next couple of weeks here? Well, I'm so used to seeing the battle between Milwaukee and St. Louis. So, so um, yeah, it's, it's very common in that division. And it's just, it's just kind of expected. St. Louis is three games back. They're going to be, I mean, look what they did last year. I, I don't remember how many games they won in a row to like get into the postseason or how many out of how many, but it was crazy. Like they were almost out of it. And then they found themselves right back in it. I, I'm a little bit more interested in, uh, in the L central with the white Sox and, and the twins, the twins aren't going anywhere. And it seems like, I mean, the white Sox have, you know, they have the ball club to get things done. Um, and, and like I said, with, with, with the Marlins, they're, they're one run away and the twins kind of slipping just a little bit, losing, you know, losing five of six and White Sox are right back in it. So there's, there's so many games left to be played, but right now I'm a little bit more interested in, in, in watching the twins and the White Sox. Um, and look, the, the White Sox are a really fun team to watch and Minnesota's playing great baseball, seven to three in the last 10 it's it's going to be fun. I I thought that, that Cleveland would would be a little bit better right now. I thought they'd be, you know, leading the division at some point. Uh they haven't um they haven't really made those strides, but you can't count them out either. No, I mean because as long as Tito's there and as long as they have the you know like they're just built with a bunch of players who to your point earlier here, like that's a team where you don't think they quit, you know, where I'm again, going back to the fan perspective of saying like, Oh, you, I think this player might be melanin or I think this team is kind of, uh, you, you know, dragging ass, like you, you very rarely see the Indians play like that. And so to that point, you know, the schedule is easy enough for them. It's not a surprise to say that the Cleveland can take advantage of, you know, a couple of series against Detroit or Kansas city in the next coming weeks. And, and they have starting pitching. They have the starting pitching that, that they need to go on and said run. So yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like the top three in that division. 
again, Milwaukee, St. Louis, always fun to watch. The, I mean, the NOS just, and the NOS is tough. I mean, Arizona, Colorado, I, at one point, all five teams had winning records in that division. Obviously that wasn't going to uh, stay the same. Arizona, Colorado are both three and seven in the last 10 run differentials are starting to slide. The, the LA, San Diego, San Francisco, like little, little threesome there is just, is just always fun to watch. Always fun to watch. Yeah. I, I really like what the Padres are doing, even though some of those guys have been slow at Hosmer. That's a great story because Hosmer's Hosmer, raking and he's, and he's like a, to me is like, he's just a classic big league first baseman. has been around forever. He's one of those guys who was a big draft, big prospect, ended up living up to the hype in, in Kansas city, won a championship, you know, had a bunch of success there, signed the big deal. Like when, that's exactly like, it's like a, it's like a textbook big league success story of the prospect coming in and doing all this stuff. And there was a little, I don't want to say uncomfortable, but just like weird how much, people were saying that Eric Hosmer last year in, in San Diego. And, and when you look at San Diego, they'd say, Oh, they got to figure out first base. They got to figure out first base. Man, his numbers like, weren't even that bad. Right. Like uh, I'm, I'm sitting here like, you know, and I was in San Diego at the end of the year. I'm like, you guys are, you guys are killing this dude. And he's, he's not having that bad of a year, mm -hmm. like just burying the guy and he phenomenal dude. He wants to come on the show, by the way, we'll get him, we'll get him on the show. Uh, yeah. He, he's raking. So uh, happy for that guy. So just then looking ahead a little bit this week, I'm very, I'm interested. The Brewers and the Padres are doing battle. That's one of those late West coast series. You know, anytime you're central or you're East, you go out West. I, those games that start at eight 40, nine 40, those, those are tough games to follow. Um, but you know, those are two very good competitive teams. And then obviously Colin, you've got that with the Mets are out in the, out in San Francisco playing a bunch of night games this week. That's a great, great series. Yeah. It's always fun for, uh, you know, teams to go to the West coast too. They're probably having a lot of families on the trip, going to San Francisco, going to L.A., going to San Diego, uh, wherever the city is. It, it's always a good one. It's it's tough travel and, and, and going back sucks, but uh, heading out west uh, is always fun for the East Coast teams. And we're, and we're going to have Kevin Gossman on Thursday. Make sure you guys are subscribed to the show. You're not going to want to miss this interview. You guys are getting this episode Tuesday morning. Kevin's pitching tonight against the Cardinals. Or I mean, yeah, against the Cardinals, the Blue Jays, the Cardinals. I highly recommend tuning in and get a sense of the type of pitcher Kevin Gossman is so that when you listen to the interview on Thursday, if you haven't watched him pitch or you haven't really like dug in your heels into a Kevin Gossman start, do it Tuesday night against the Cardinals. It's going to make our interview on Thursday the conversation. It's so fucking sweet. Listen, it'll be a two-pitch starter, a dominant two-pitch starter in Major League Baseball. Absolutely. You know, Gosman is he's a great kid. He's easy to root for. I wish we would have got to play together a little bit longer, but uh, really looking forward to uh, to having him on. And, and, and like you said, man, follow that guy's career because he's, he's a good one. Last segment, it's called housekeeping. Colin, this is the first time you're hearing about this segment. Is there anything that we're missing as we go, as we get uh, as we get ready for Thursday as we kind of wrap up the show here? I don't think so. I think we pretty much covered everything. You crossed everything off your list. Wow. Yeah. Fifth episode, we just did that. No housekeeping. I don't think so. Everything's we're good prepared on my end here. Well, we're getting more more well prepared. Yeah, right? Like that? Yes. I mean, you know what? No housekeeping because Jake's internet and camera and everything is perfect. So it's in tip top, tip it's top beautiful. guys. How's well, it thank feel? You. Thanks for saying that. How does it feel? I got, I got a much more comfortable chair. The lights are fine. I mean, they're cheapos off Amazon, but the camera, Colin, thank you for sending me this camera. We're finally in HD. Once I get moved into this new house, it's going to, it's going to get even better. It's going to get, yeah, even let's, let's do a little new house stuff. I think, I think there's a lot of people that listen to our show that are, look at houses. Maybe they just bought a new house. I know I'm in the process of looking at houses and stuff like that, but you've bought a bunch of houses. This is like, and I'm not saying like you own houses. You just, it's like one year you buy a house and you move into the next one. And like, you're a house guy. This is your what? Fourth house. <laughs> well, shit. We've, uh, we've been building this house for four years. Yeah. So for a four year uh, build, we had to, we had to fire our first builder just you know just a crook whatever so we're we're going through that but we're probably three weeks away from moving in and what people don't know a lot about us or just baseball players in general is we're we're nomads we we live in a place in the off season we have a spring training house we have a house during the season and you never completely feel um feel settled 
and all the way throughout my career, I've been, been all over the place. I bought my first house in Austin in 08. We sold that one. We moved to Lakeway and then we bought another one. It's just a constant runaround. So for the first time in our lives, we are going to uh, not be living like college kids, but I love it. You know, we have, you didn't, you didn't come to the house, but we've been eating with, you know, plastic silverware for the last year and a half, which I actually like. So it's going to be nice to use a real fork. Yeah, clean, uh, the cleanup is easier on the plastic stuff, but at the same time, you know, environmental concerns. I think it's actually cool, dude, to hear that because, like, you think about, you know, the perception of, like, well, you know, big deal in Philly and, you know, success and stuff, and you just think, like, it is cool to hear on some relatable level, like, dude, if you haven't felt settled, like, I don't give a fuck. I don't care how great life is. If you don't feel settled and, like, you don't feel like you have a place to go home at the end of the day that's not, like, truly yours, like, that's a big, that's a big miss. Yeah. I mean, I'm not complaining about it. We, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of <laughs> partially, partially our fault by some of the decisions we've, we've made, but again, we were uh, very, very flexible. We, we make things work. Our kids are great. They just kind of go with the flow. And uh, before you know it, we'll be settled. Yeah. This is not an invitation either for people to send me their, like if you're in mortgage business or you sell houses, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm still doing research on my own. So don't take this as a solicitation to do some business um again subscribe for the show interview with yes. kevin gossman coming next week's awesome you know do subscribe and uh and we appreciate you guys tuning in good episode carl love you guys love you too jake this has been fun